Okay, hi everyone, I'm Yoss. Uh, I work at PayPal. And today I'd like to share with you uh, GraphQL, which is a new way to build and expose uh, web APIs. So you can follow along. Uh, the slides are available at this URL. I'll just keep it there for a few seconds so you can put it down if you'd like. Okay, so just to get this over with, um, I work at PayPal, but this is uh, from my own personal experimentation and nothing to do with yep, this just personal stuff. So I'll, I'll walk you through a um, bit of background about where web, a web APIs are at the moment, followed by REST, which is how we're currently building web APIs. We'll then get into GraphQL and some code of an actual GraphQL service written in Node, and that's it. So this is the key idea of my talk. If, there's not, if nothing else, um, this is it that an API is a user interface for developers. So we should put some effort into making it pleasant, that the user experience of an API matters. So a bit of background. So today, web APIs are eating the world. So there's a service for every imaginable need, payments, video encoding, file storage, analytics, transactional email. Most likely, if you're building a web app today, you'll be using one of these services. And uh, so APIs are pretty important. But for some of you, you might be wondering, hey, but I'm not building an API, so why should I care? So how many of you use Slack at work or personally? A lot of people use Slack. Um, so I think part of the reason we use Slack is because of the massive selection of integrations available. We could, for example, uh, notify a channel when a PR is built, a uh, PR is opened, or when a CI job completes or when a deploy is successful. And how was Slack able to do this? Each integration wasn't built by Slack's developers, but rather by third-party developers that found it very easy to integrate with Slack's API. So I think we can attribute part of Slack's success to the fact that their API has a great user experience, and that generates immense value for Slack and the users. So web APS, uh, APS is pretty important. The user experience matters. So next, I'll be. We're going to REST, which is um, how we're currently building web APIs. So the key idea of REST is we separate our API to different logical resources. So for example, if you have a blogging platform, you would have things like users, uh, posts, users, and comments, for example. And then we map CRUD actions, create, read, update, delete, to a combination of HTTP methods, such as get and post, and URIs. So for example, to retrieve a list of posts, we make an HTTP GET request through the post namespace, and so on, for each CRUD action. So for the rest of this talk, let's imagine that we're building a Hacker News or Reddit clone. And so we have a list of posts and links, which are essentially links to interesting stuff. Uh, so what resources do we need? First would be posts, and others could be users and comments. So this example will be revisiting throughout this talk. And this could be a possible data model for such a, an app. We have three tables with some, with some fields. And we expose some endpoints for, to allow our API consumers to interact with the underlying data model. Yeah. So that's it. Wow, we're done with our REST API. So we can REST easy, right? <laughs> uh, well, let's try using our API. So again, this is what we're trying to build, uh, what we're trying to render. So first, we have to make uh, an API call to get a list of posts. So we get to the post namespace. And we get a JSON response, which is an array of JSON objects. Uh, but we're still missing the author's uh, username here. So we have to make a separate API call to get the user's name. But we have to do this for every single post. Um, so the problem is we have, multiple, have to make multiple round trips. Each API call is a separate request response cycle. And especially on mobile, where we have variable network conditions, it might be undesirable. So one solution is we auto load, we allow the clients to specify that, hey, I also want to load this other resource alongside my post. Uh, but this solution seems more of a hack, because again, one is that we, we are polluting the endpoint, the post endpoint, by specifying, hey, there's this other resource I want to um, pull alongside the post. And another problem with REST APIs is we often overfetch. So a lot of APIs, usually, you get a massive JSON object in, in that is returned. 
even though we might only be using, say, a couple of fields. So, and another solution is, again, clients should maybe be able to specify only the fields that they, that they need. But again, the query string, mm, not as clean a solution, I think. And so one solution is uh, we create a custom endpoint for each client in each version, which returns exactly the fields they need. So they don't have to manually specify fields in their query strings. But the problem with this is you end up with a massive uh, amount of endpoints that are very tightly coupled to the clients. And it's, this is also not desirable. And a final challenge with uh, APIs is documentation. It's pretty important. Imagine integrating with a third-party API with no documentation. If you're lucky, maybe they have some hate OS links that you can discover the API, but it's a nightmare. So how, who, will you, who needs to learn about our API? So if you have an API product, this, this would be your users, your API consumers. If you're working in like a microservices setting, it would be developers from other teams that need to consume your service. Or it could be new hires who needs to get on board very quickly and start getting productive. And the documentation must cover things like, what resources does the API manage? What, what, what can I do with the API? And for each endpoint, what parameters does it accept? And is it a string? Is it an integer? So these things have, have to be documented and accessible to your API consumers. And currently, the solution to this is something called an API specification language. So how many of you have heard of Swagger? Right. So Swagger is essentially, and others are essentially a DSL to describe your APIs. So for example, my API has this endpoint, and it returns a string, for example. Or it takes a parameter, and it, it's an ID, for example. And the benefit of using API spec languages to describe your API is that you can auto-generate a lot of these things. Because as a single source of, source of truth, your documentation can be sure to match the underlying implementation. So you can auto-generate documentation, server steps, and client code, and many others. So it saves you a lot of effort. So to summarize very quickly, um, these are the drawbacks of REST that GraphQL tries to solve. So first is multiple round trips. Um, you need multiple REST calls to get the data that you need. Then you have custom endpoints, um, because the problem is because APIs are rigid by default. You can't change the response that you get without changing the backend code. And finally, documentation is a challenge. So next, we'll look at GraphQL, which is the most exciting part, I think. So GraphQL. So GraphQL is actually more than one thing. Uh, first of all, it's a query language for the clients to describe the shape of the data that they need to pull from the server. That's the first thing. The second thing is it's a type system for both the client and the server to have a shared vocabulary uh, of what the objects they are discussing. And finally, it's a runtime for the server to translate the queries from the clients into a JSON response, for example. So it was devised by the Facebook product team to solve some of the problems that we've seen in the previous section. It's data store independent. It doesn't make any assumptions about database or uh, data store that you're using. Um, you could use SQL, NoSQL, or even another REST API. Uh, it's language and platform independent. Bindings are available in most major languages and frameworks. So you can definitely use GraphQL for your stack. So the name of graph in GraphQL has actually nothing to do with graph databases. It's actually from the fact that we can technically model our business domains as a graph. So from this diagram, uh, so this is like a library system. You can imagine it's like a library uh, system. We have books and authors. So if you look at the top book node, the one with the dashed, um, circle. Uh, a book has a title, so it has an edge to economy, the economics of inequality. And it has authors. It, um, so the edges here refer to the relationships between the objects in your business domain. And GraphQL lets you extract trees from this graph of relationships. So for example, one possible tree might be starting from the top book node, we traverse the graph, we follow the outgoing arrows, and until we can't anymore. So that's one tree. So formally, a tree is a directed acyclic graph with only one parent per node. So this is the key idea of graph in GraphQL. So, to me, so this is a, an actual GraphQL query. So on the left is a GraphQL query. 
And on the right is the response that a graphical service returns. So if you look at this, you can sort of tell from, just from the shape of the graphical query what the response would look like. So this is what they mean when they say GraphQL is declarative. So the key idea here, here is that we give power to the client instead of the server. It's the client can choose to specify the, only the data that it needs, and the server will do what's necessary and optimize on the server side to return the data. Right? So the client is no longer beholden to what the uh, server returns. And GraphQL server is just like a REST server or, or an RPC server. It accepts GraphQL queries from clients and returns a JSON payload. And behind the scenes, the GraphQL service can be talking to multiple data sources. And it's completely abstracted away from the clients. So again, it occupies the same space as REST and RPC. It's a view for your underlying business domain. So here's a quick example. Um, you can go to this URL. If you'd like to follow along, actually, I actually have it open here. So this is a GraphQL IDE. This is called Graphical. It's a, essentially, it's like a Postman or a web IDE for GraphQL services, uh, servers. So on the left here, we enter our query, graph, GraphQL queries. So if, for example, let's say you want to return posts. and and you press this, Graf graphical will um, just fix some uh, solvable issues on their own. So here, we're retrieving posts, the IDs of all our posts. And let's say you want to change, uh, pull a different attribute. You can check the documentation and see what this root returns. So posts returns an array of type post. So let's look at what posts can return. So post has these following fields. So we can just, so it has autocomplete as well. And let's try pulling the author as well. So the author is a type user. And let's see what user returns. And let's get the name. And that's it. So we, we extract the, op the complex um, graph of relationships of our business domain in a single API call. So that's pretty cool. And one other thing is, nice thing about a GraphQL is, because the, the schema is saved on both the server and the client, the client can perform client-side validation. So for example, name is an invalid uh, field here for the type post. And the client can know even before we send the, this request to the server that a, if a query is valid or not. Yeah. So that's graphical. So wow, the first time I saw this, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> this, is, this is the thing, wow. And when you compare the user experience of the graphical to pouring through pages and pages of API documentation, it's clear that graphical, uh, GraphQL has a better user experience. And when you think about it, having a great API documentation is actually a good marketing tool. It drives adoption, especially if your product is an API. And how is this possible? The type system that underlies GraphQL makes this possible. So if you use RPC frameworks, this might seem familiar. Of, or if you use Swagger, this might seem familiar. Or protocol buffers, this also might seem familiar. Um, so the schema language uh, lets you describe the, dom the objects of your domain. So for example, in a blogging platform, you have a post object with the fields title, author, and comments. And each field has a type. For example, this could be a scalar type, scalar types, just string. Or it could be another custom type, such as user and comment. So the exclamation points just means it's uh, non-null. And we also have to define the roots, possible roots of our tree. Uh, usually, it's called the query type or root type. Yeah, I won't spend too much time here. And it's a full type system. Uh, you have scalar types. You have more advanced versions like enums, list interfaces, tag unions, you know, some types, and so on. So you can describe your business domain very accurately. So how does GraphQL solve the drawbacks of uh, REST, as we've seen in the previous section? Uh, first, it's, uh, it's a single round trip. 
Uh, you don't have to make multiple REST calls to get all uh, the graph of relationships. It's client-specified. You don't need custom endpoints because the clients can just tell you exactly what they need, and you just give it to them. And it's so introspective. Um, because you, uh, by annotating your business domain, you get a lot of, free, a lot of stuff for free, such as the graphical playground, client-side validation, and documentation. Yep, so that's GraphQL. So now, to make it more concrete, let's look at an actual uh, GraphQL server written in Node. So to create a GraphQL server, you need two things. You need a schema, which is essentially a description of your business domain, the objects in your like, uh, application, and resolver functions, which tell GraphQL where to pull the data from. And for this example, we'll be using Node and Express. Uh, but again, bindings are available in all major languages. So yeah, you're free to use which ever you would like. So this is, this is visible, right? OK. So we'll be looking at three files, package the JSON server schema. So package the JSON is like a Ruby gem file, a Python requirements.txt, or a Java pom.xml. Um, it lists out the dependencies of your application. So this is our dependencies. And these are the graphical libraries that we are using for our um, graphical service. And then we have server. Um, server. Uh, essentially, first we are importing the graphical library, a point to a schema, which we'll be covering next. This is nothing. And, and then we use the graphical middleware to enable our, graph, uh, our route slash GraphQL to interpret GraphQL queries from the client using our given schema. So essentially, one interesting thing is that in GraphQL, there's only a single endpoint. Is the slash GraphQL endpoint. Oops. And then we start the server. So this is the actual schema. Um, first, we import the uh, types that we'll be using uh, in our um, schema, such as lists, uh, object type, which is, which is for custom types, strings, integers, floats, and so on. Uh, we then point to our data source. So this is just a, uh, this could be your ORM or your database, just a light wrapper over your data source. And this is the actual um, schema of your object. So we'll take a look at this very slowly so, and so we can understand it fully. So first, we define some metadata. So for example, what's the name of our um, uh, type? And object type here just means it's a type with, the, uh, a type with some fields that might be uh, of other types. And so for each type, we define the fields that it has, for example, ID. And for each field, we define its type. For example, an ID is an integer, title is a string, URL is a string, and so on. And then for associations to links to other nodes, essentially, if you remember the uh, graph uh, diagram, outgoing nodes to other non-leaf nodes needs a resolve function, which tells GraphQL where to get the data from. So for example, this author here is of type user, and the resolve is a function which accepts the, the source node, for example, uh, that means like the post node, and uses that information to retrieve the next uh, node, in this case, the user. Yeah, any, um, anyone, any questions at this point? Okay. And then next, we have to uh, define the roots the possible roots of our tree. And this is often called the query type. So for example, so the query type defines the valid starting points of our queries. And so post we've seen in the graphical demo. Um, so post is a possible root of our tree. And it's type list, a list of posts. It returns a list of type post. You can also specify arguments. Uh, which lets us specify acceptable arguments for a particular node. So for example, I didn't actually show you, but uh, you can specify um, arguments along with your query. And then you can make use of these arguments in your resolve function, which again pulls the, lets the GraphQL know where to get your data from. And finally, we return the schema, and that's it. OK, well, thank you. So we've seen this uh, graphical. 
And so the thing about resolver functions is I mentioned that uh, graphical is um, data store independent. In your resolve function, you can technically do anything as long as it returns the data that you need. You could make another, uh, you, can make, uh, you could call another API, you could do some SQL, raw SQL queries, or you could use some ORM. Yep. So that's pretty much it. Uh, in closing, give GraphQL a try. I think it's pretty interesting, especially if your product is an API or if you have many clients with flexible requirements. Um, I didn't cover, deliberately didn't cover many features of the uh, GraphQL because these are mostly syntax sugar, sure. but the core idea is the same. And because GraphQL is still pretty new, best practices are still emerging. So yeah, we'll see what, how GraphQL uh, comes along. And if you, so just a bit of a plug. Um, if you're interested in all things like APIs, like API design, API development processes, and new technologies like GraphQL, do check out uh, this meetup group, API Craft Singapore. I think, uh, I think you'll be interested in something like this. And thanks. <laughs> yep. Oh, you mentioned all about reading. Uh, can you do rights? Yes. yes. So in GraphQL, it's called mutations. Um, I didn't cover it because uh, it's actually more of the same. It's, it's, yes, it's possible. So what you do is, actually, I have an example here. Uh, demo. So I can quickly demo some writes. So in GraphQL, it's called mutations. And it's, just, it's something like RPC. For example, um, just show you. So you just do this, and you specify all the arguments to so return either success or a success response or the object or whatever you wish. Yeah, this is pretty much the same. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you.